Now, before the party begins, let's go over the details. You think I don't see you for who you really are? Can, can, can. We reap what we sow. Follow me. <laughs> Just doing a little sport. One of two things is going to happen. Either these people will somehow wake up from their psychosis and realize that they're crazy, or the Civil War will come. YouTube is an absolute mess lately. Seems like everywhere you turn, there's someone with a channel where they rant to the audience about something that makes them angry. It gets even worse once you enter the nerd fandoms. It's hard to even watch a trailer for a Marvel film without having YouTube recommend to you a video about how The Last Jedi murdered your parents and stole your wallet. I'm Ashley Lynch, and this is Media Offline, a series about the ways in which we consume media. And this is not an outrage. Recently, Captain Marvel went on to earn over a billion dollars, making it the highest grossing film with a female lead in Marvel's third highest grossing solo film. But if you've been watching YouTube pundits leading up to the release of the movie, this should have never happened. They all but assured you that Captain Marvel was not only going to be Marvel Studios' first financial failure, but that star Brie Larson murders young men by the dozen before bathing their blood and feeding their flesh to a ravenous pack of ocelots. How did a predictable blockbuster movie in a long-running franchise prompt such a widespread and angry response? To answer that, we need to go back. It was the year 1977. Disco was king and Star Wars reigned at the theater... No, that's too far. We need to go to... Hong Kong. 2007. This was where Steve Bannon first joined Internet Gaming Entertainment, a company started by Mighty Ducks 2 actor Brock Pierce. IGE was a company that hired people to farm gold and loot in MMO games, and sold those digital items on a real marketplace for real money. But the company crashed and burned when gamers did what they do best, got really angry and screamed until companies capitulated to their whims. They put so much pressure on the video game companies, but they decided to basically ban gold farming, which killed Bannon's business, but it awakened him to the power of what he called rootless white males who spend all their time online. And five years later, when Bannon wound up at Breitbart, he resolved to try and attract those people over to Breitbart because he thought they could be uh, radicalized in a kind of populist, nationalist way. Fast forward to 2014, and we got a gate. Bannon found his angry gamers, and now at Breitbart, he used his platform to help fuel and whip them into a frenzied mob. It was depressingly successful. So much so that it attracted MRAs, pickup artists, juice salesmen, and dyed in the wool neo-Nazis to its cause. It's also where the term SJW, or social justice warrior, started to be pushed into the mainstream consciousness as a pejorative for anyone who advocated for equal rights or greater representation in media. Everything was broken down into a base tribalism of us versus them. Every paranoid schizophrenic has one, a them, a they, and it. And you want to hear about my them, don't you? And while these angry gamers were being primed to rage against anything that challenged the status quo in popular media, Bannon was channeling their outrage towards white nationalism and a presidential election. And then this shit happened. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. And this shit. Jews will not replace us! And this shit. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. There was another important development that occurred around the same time. Patreon is a new funding platform kind of like Kickstarter, but there's one big difference. It's not used to raise tons of funds for one big project. Instead, it's for people who are making lots of things all the time, like YouTube videos. Content creators now had a platform to leverage their growing audiences into actual money. And for creators with large subscriber bases, suddenly making YouTube videos became a financially viable career path. And for popular anti-feminist YouTubers like Thunderfoot and Sargon of Akkad, we saw their subscription numbers growing with Steve Bannon's angry gamers. Hating women became good business. And there was no woman they hated more than Anita Sarkeesian. She committed the ultimate sin of being a feminist and talking about video games. And the mere fact that they all believe such retarded shit gives you some insight into why they financially elected Anita Sarkeesian to be their most intellectual feminist 
on gaming. And so for several years, she became a cultural boogeyman for Bannon's angry gamers. YouTube anti-feminists were making thousands of dollars a week stoking anger and outrage with a single edict directed at their audiences. This woman must be destroyed at any cost. Pundit grifters pandering to the fears and outrage of the conservative right for money isn't anything new or novel. Hell, it's Fox News' entire business strategy. But now the bar for entry was a webcam and email account and the willingness to be as toxic as possible. The whole idea of, of being down with intersectionality and shit like that, it, it's, what, what is it ultimately? Ultimately, it's trying to appease women, and not even all women, because most women don't like these effete little soy boy cucks. No line was too far, and anyone who said otherwise was just an SJW that could be easily dismissed. For all their constant criticism that Anita was a quote-unquote professional victim, these YouTube personalities all had their hands out, and every day new players emerged to claim a piece of that pie. It was only a matter of time before this faux outrage seeped into movies. It started slowly at first, with fringe groups that are always angry announcing entirely ineffective boycotts. But this anti-progressive mob of Bannon's angry gamers had no choice but to spill out of games and bring their toxic fight against inclusion into other mediums. And the campaigns with each film became larger, louder, and more coordinated. And this went on. You know, Disney and Lucasfilm, you know, have some sort of hidden agenda or maybe it's not so hidden, but they, they, they're definitely pushing an agenda with these latest Star Wars film. And on. So all men are evil or incompetent, except for non-white males, of course, with the exception of one, the Chris Pine character, who must die. And on. I don't know if, if you notice anything here, but uh, that's a man. Fast forward to today and there are thousands and thousands of videos on YouTube about how Brie Larson has destroyed the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It was a veritable cottage industry of anti-feminist hate. This guy in particular, from the channel Geeks and Gamers, has recorded over a hundred videos specifically to complain about Captain Marvel and Brie Larson. We're less than a month from Captain Marvel. Less than a month, they continue to push this feminism agenda, they continue to push away all of the the bands that make up the MCU based on race and gender. Like this is racist and sexist comments made by the star of Captain Marvel. So what is the source of all this anger towards her? Well, it's this. So earlier this week, USC Annenberg's inclusive initiative released findings that 67% of the top critics reviewing the 100 highest grossing movies in 2017 were white males. Less than a quarter were white women and less than 10% were unrepresented men. Only 2.5% of those top critics were women of color. So you're probably thinking right now like, wow, that super doesn't represent the country that I live in and that's because that's true. This is a huge disconnect from the US population breakdown of 30% white men, 30% white women, 20% men of color, and 20% women of color. Am I saying that I hate white dudes? No, I'm not. But what I am saying is, is that if you make a movie that is a love letter to women of color, there is an insanely low chance a woman of color will have the chance to see your movie and review your movie. Other people besides white dudes like Star Wars and would love the opportunity to do a set visit. And I'm also saying I don't hate white dudes. I'm just saying we need to be conscious of our bias and do our part to make sure that everyone is in the room. The bottom line is, is that if each of the top 100 films in a year added nine critics that are three underrepresented males, three white females, three underrepresented females, and the, the average critic pool would match the US population in just five years. That's it. Brie Larson to a room full of industry professionals said that film journalism needs to have more diversity if more diverse films are ever gonna get a fair shake. And she has a point. We've seen that male film critics tend not to rate female-led films as high as they do male-led films. And based upon this, Brie used her position of privilege on one of the biggest films of the year to request that Captain Marvel's press junket not be the same sea of white dudes that are normally sent. 
This is how change happens, folks. But for a much less rational audience, we got this. Just this moron, this woman who's a complete fool, who's doing the press tour, the press junket, in support of Captain Marvel. And what is she doing? She is antagonizing her future audience. She is throwing shit on precisely the people who would want to see her goddamn movie. Brie Larson has admitted that she's a racist, she's a sexist, and she's a thug. She's advocating violence, she hates white males, so she's a racist and she's a sexist. Suddenly Brie was a man-hating racist, and Marvel was apparently alienating their core audience with this forced feminist SJW politicking. The writing was on the wall. According to every pandering YouTuber, Captain Marvel was going to bomb. But let's step across the pond and visit those other people. You know, the DC Comics people. Right ain't over yet. My man! Because there was this whole subgroup of DC fans who have arguably been on a longer, slower boil, but in the same trajectory. As the DC film struggled to find praise from both critics and audiences, hardcore DC fans invented a conspiracy that Marvel was bribing critics to give DC films bad reviews. A theory first floated in part by screenwriter and Joffrey impersonator Max Landis. When pressed for names of these critics that were being bought off, he retracted his statement, but the conspiracy only grew larger. The whole thing is so absurd just on the face of it. You would think if Disney were trying to buy off film critics, one of them would, you know, write about it, if only to advance their career and expose one of the biggest public frauds in the film industry. So as you would expect, there were conspiracies galore surrounding Captain Marvel. Because if you're gonna make thousands and thousands of videos about how Brie Larson is the Antichrist, then you gotta have some variety. Here's some choice cuts. Captain Marvel is tracking to be a financial failure. Men are being denied advanced ticket sales because of Brie Larson. Captain Marvel needs to earn $750 million just to break even. Disney wants to promote feminism at any cost and doesn't care if Captain Marvel loses money. Box office numbers have been forged by Disney. Disney is buying up seats in empty theaters. An alternate ending of Avengers Endgame was filmed where Captain Marvel dies in case Captain Marvel bombed. The Avengers cast hates Brie Larson. I even made up one of those. Can you tell which one? Give up? Trick question. None of those are made up, but all of them are false. I'd have to wonder why Disney would break out this nuclear option of massive fraud for Captain Marvel, but wouldn't do it for something like Solo, a Star Wars movie. Not to mention that at that time, Disney was in the middle of negotiating a massive deal for $73 billion with a B to buy 20th Century Fox. The type of deal that perpetrating a massive fraud, like say buying up empty theaters, would threaten. These channels have been ranting for months about how Captain Marvel is going to leave Disney in financial ruins and bring down Marvel. They've been saying for years this mantra of get woke, go broke. Their solution to this bullshit blowing up in their faces? To assert that Captain Marvel did in fact go broke. And Disney was playing puppet master to maintain an illusion that only the people who'd stake their reputations on the film filling could see through. How utterly convenient. But yeah, there's just so much proof of like no nobody in these theaters, but there's so many theaters showing you have to marvel. And yes, you know, you pile that on top of the the people who who genuinely wanted to go see Alita or go some, see something else. <laughs> 